Hey guys, uh, I'm going to go over some stuff that I find helpful throughout the years of running competitions and events, uh, and obstacle design and course design, uh, things that hopefully can help you on your course designs and obstacle designs alike. So the process that I go through uh, may be a little different than you, uh, but this is what has been working for me uh, and has been successful for my competitions. Uh, so I want to start with the obstacle design process. For me, there are many different things that can inspire an obstacle, uh, whether it's a particular movement I want to try and make happen, uh, a certain visual that I'm looking for, uh, some sort of alternative variation of an obstacle, uh, a reproduction of an obstacle that I've already seen or done, uh, or a filler obstacle, so something that I just need to put within the course to get from one spot to another, um, stuff like that. For instance, a movement uh, could be uh, one of the movements that I've been looking to try and create into a, a good obstacle is a reverse body prop. So instead of pushing hands and feet to create tension outward, uh, I want to have something that's inward. So something where it would be uh, you're pulling in with the arms and then engaging the knees and core to keep you on a block or underneath a block. Here's my reverse body prop idea. So I would have to have something hanging with two edges that you would compress in. Uh, and so here would be a little example of a little sticky person. So I like to draw what the pieces are and how the person fits into it, then try and build the structure around it. So I would need something for them to pull against, something comfortable for their legs to go against. Uh, and that ends up going into something like two angled surfaces, which would be ideal. Uh, and even better if I can adjust it, and even better if I can hang it from something uh, so that it can be multifunctional. Problem is, many problems. Uh, that's why it hasn't gone in a, a competition. We'll talk about problems later with what makes an obstacle you know, worthwhile for a competition or not. Uh, but that movement is a certain move that I want to have as an obstacle, uh, but until I find a good way to utilize it, it doesn't get in the course. So other inspirations, like a visual, uh, I had a big mouth around the, the spider wall, so you had to jump through and into the mouth where the mouth outside would all be considered truss. You have to shoot that gap into the spider wall. I'll uh, use that for one of our Halloween competitions. An alteration uh, or a variation on an obstacle, the swinging monkey bars um, that Force 5 made, I put them on the rock wall. So it became uh, a different version, uh, but still very similar, easy to slip out, have to move those pegs. And we did that for our NNL regional for the Midwest. A reproduction, our competition right before that, I made the corkscrew obstacle from season 12. Um, and then a filler obstacle. So uh, for instance, at the regional competition, I wanted them to go down this one path at the very end. So a lache to vertical limits, down to a bar to cannonballs. Um, and I need a way for them to get there. So after a cliffhanger down, rather than go into it and skip pieces, I added a uh, cannonball with hooks just along the truss to get back to that same starting point. Uh, just something fun and a little bit different, uh, but a way to just get from A to B to start the one I really wanted to do. So those are the five things that inspire me to get to a particular obstacle. If there's a different way they get you there, that's awesome. Uh, but for me, it's either a specific movement, a visual that I'm looking for, an alteration of an obstacle that already exists, a recreation of an obstacle, or a filler to get from one spot to another. Now, let's go into what makes an obstacle a problem. Problems that the obstacle may have. The obstacle is not structurally sound, it could fall apart. The obstacle is not progressible between waves, so if I have different age groups, I can't adjust it or I have to make multiples to make it useful for every age group. Uh, the obstacle is skippable. Someone could just beta the whole thing and not use it. Uh, the obstacle is dangerous, which means someone could get hurt on it. The obstacle is not easy to reset, so it would require a lot of climbing, rigging, and setting, which would take up a lot of time. Uh, obstacle is inconsistent, so it would be something that would be, even if it's reset, it can be altered, it can be squished. You know, a lot of squishy pads can get dented over time. Um, 
the obstacle is too easy or too hard. We want something that's going to be balanced throughout the course. Uh, the obstacle is not clearly defined or presented, so something that's hard to make out what it is or where it starts and where it ends is a problem and an obstacle that's not appropriate for that placement in the course so maybe i have a really off or a really awesome obstacle for the cliffhanger variation but the way that my course is laid out the cliffhanger is built into the gym where obstacle three would be and it would be way too difficult for that so it's not appropriate for that spot in the course when i go into designing the obstacle i'm gonna clip this up so you can see it obstacle design I'm looking at the safety, I'm looking at the construction, the consistency of it, its adjustability, the speed, the athlete's options, is it fun, and the visuals. Not necessarily in this order, but pretty close is how I go through it. It's just important that you look through all of these. So, uh, we'll start with safety, since that's real important for athletes. Uh, safety in an obstacle design. Uh, is there appropriate padding? Um, you know, what happens if someone has to bail out? Uh, what are their bail options? Is that a safe path for them to fall? Uh, a big issue a lot of gyms have is balance obstacles. You can make a really challenging balance obstacle, but if they fall, there's some big risks of, you know, them hurting their arms or their ankles just because of the height and the padding that it takes. Um, is it breakable? Is there a chance that it's going to snap or break? Um, how high is it off the ground? You know, I could have an obstacle that's an inch off the ground over a four foot crash pad, or I can have an obstacle that's, you know, four feet off the ground over carbon bonded foam. So what's the height off the ground for that athlete? And it's gonna change for every age group. Uh, what's the speed that it's going to be moving, that the athletes are gonna be moving through it? That's gonna play into how they're gonna bail on that obstacle. Let's say, for instance, a zip line that has a lot of speed coming into it or any type of slider or dipper or moving obstacle. Um, how much speed are they going to get into it? And not just how much do you want them to get, but if I try and huck myself at it, how much speed can I get? And is it safely set up for someone to do that? Um, what's the impact like on the landing platforms? Uh, are they padded? Are they stiff? Um, you know, when they're coming in on those, those big jumps, what is that impact? Same thing on shoulders coming in on obstacles and transfers. Um, and are there any projectiles? So uh, hanging, swinging monkey bars, those bars can fall. Any pegs, if you have any um, you know, cannonball pegs, those cannonballs can come out. Just to be aware of these things and make sure that they're put somewhere in the course where those that are skillful enough and strong enough to know that a uh, resin cannonball can fall out on them that they're aware of that falling um, not everyone especially first timers in they're just gonna think move 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 and then once they give up they fall and then they're just waiting at the bottom they don't realize something's gonna be coming on their head uh, let's see so that's our that safety uh, that brings us into construction so what's the cost how much money what's your budget you know to make this obstacle can you reuse some obstacles that you have to make it um, repurposed into this obstacle. So I made the Grim Sweeper, a version of the Grim Sweeper for our regional, and I used our Flying Squirrel arms to make that Grim Sweeper because I already had the brackets on it, already had it cut. All I needed to do is reinforce it and hook it up. Um, your ability to make it. Are you capable of? Do you know how to make it? Do you know someone who can make it? Uh, and then again, that brings it back into cost. How much is it going to cost someone else to build it? Uh, and then, of course, the structural integrity. Always expect it to take more beating than you want it to. Let's say you have, I'll use the Grim Sweeper, for example. Uh, so for the Grim Sweeper, I had him going from Salmon Ladder, Grim Sweeper around, transfer to another one, Grim Sweeper around, landing platform. Now, uh, I expect them to swing, catch, go, lache over and make their dismount. However, if someone gets stuck or, you know, they don't know where to go or whatever happens, you don't know, who's to say that they're not going to get in line with that next sweeper from the back end, try and build that swing, putting a lot of downward force 
in this direction against the pole as opposed to this direction around that rotation. So I need to be ready that it can take that impact in all directions because I don't know where people are gonna go. I have to presume they're gonna do something that I'm not ready for. Um, and then spare replacement parts. If possible, at every obstacle that you're making, especially if it's new, have an extra one available. Or if you know that there's a weak point to it, have an extra one of those ready to go. You never want to have an obstacle break and have to do a rerun, anything like that. But making sure that you have at least a replacement in those small chances keeps you from screwing up the entire competition. If you ran, let's say, 20 out of 40 runners, you're halfway through, and the obstacle breaks and you do not have a replacement ready, not only did you lose time, but now the obstacle is different for those next 20 runners. You may have to rerun all those 20 runners before that to make sure it's fair and equal for everyone. So always make sure you have an extra or replacement for anything that's new and that you're building. That kind of brings us into consistency. You know, what's the reset of it? Can you reset it efficiently every time? And what's the stability of it? So if I have an obstacle, we'll keep using that Grim Sweeper for example, that pivoting arm like a propeller. If it's pivoting around and it's doing good, but over time it starts to bend down and now it becomes a sloper grab, that's not consistent. That's gonna be an issue for those ninjas down the line and it's not gonna be fair to them. So making sure that you have consistency in the stability of the obstacle. So squishy pads as well. If you're doing, let's say dominoes and those pads, you're running over them the same way, you might need to rotate them every runner so that it doesn't continue to push down on one end and make a soft divot or an uneven pressure. Um, and that really is dependent upon what that obstacle is. Is it going to decay over time? Is it gonna get damaged as people are going? Uh, and then consistency of resets. Have your marks everywhere you can. So if I have an obstacle, on my floor, I'm gonna have one piece of Velcro or tape at the front and one on the side, at least one corner to mark into place if it's something that needs both edges because it can rotate. Have that, if it's something I just need a center point like a, a circle, I can just put it on the front and back because I know they all have to be in a straight line or I can go around the entire thing. But make sure you mark everything so that it's consistently reset for every athlete and then you got to make sure you go through and check every obstacle before the runner. You hate having something not reset. It is one of the veins of my existence when you're running a competition and obstacles not reset. All right, adjustability. Now, different ages. I want every ninja in my course to be able to have access to all the obstacles. So if I create a course, I don't want to have like a really cool adult course and then a lame kids course or like an awesome preteens course and then the elite course is kind of lackluster. I want to try and make those cool new obstacles accessible to everyone along that path. So making an obstacle adjustable for all ages. Now that doesn't mean I have to have a spider wall that I can shrink in every time. Uh, but making that spider wall accessible to those ages. So. Maybe it's a body prop for those really small, or what we did in the uh, regionals, we put a balance tank in the middle so they could balance tank over it or spider wall it and use their hands. And then the older age groups, I took away the balance tank. And then the higher age groups, they had a harder transition into the spider wall. And then they also had to go and avoid pieces in there. So there's always ways to change the difficulty of it. The hard part is making it accessible for the younger ones, especially if you're designing for that elite or adult to be able to scale it down. Um, and then different difficulties. When you're thinking of all these obstacles and you're running through your head, can I make it safe? Can I reset it consistently? Am I gonna be able to adjust it? When you're adjusting, it's not just for age and size, but for skill level. So if I make an obstacle, I was like, this is a really cool obstacle. I, I think it's gonna work great but I test it and find out it's way too hard, can I scale it back and make it doable for that course? Or, and I find out it's too easy and I need to challenge them because they're not gonna be pumped out by the time they get to the next obstacle. 
I gotta have a way to adjust it. And if you're creative enough, you can figure that out on the fly, but it's much better to have those resources already done before you bring it into the course. And then different speeds. Um, so not just like we talked about with the zip line of, you know, maybe I start at the very top and I get a lot of speed. Maybe I start lower and I get less speed. Um, maybe I make them jump to it so they don't get a running start. Uh, it's important that you can adjust the variability of how fast they're going through something. So let's say I do spinning logs. Can I control how much they spin? If possible, very helpful. And now let's talk about speed more so. Uh, but speed this time we're talking about the time in relation to uh, the difficulty of it. So how much time does it take to get through that obstacle? A cargo net is a big obstacle that I hate putting in competitions because it's a very slow obstacle, but it's, it's not all that difficult. It's just a lot of movement of awkward hands, feet, that sort of stuff, but it's not necessarily taxing. Um, there are ways to make it more challenging for sure. The time to difficulty ratio should be there. I shouldn't have an obstacle that takes a really long time, but is super easy. Like I wouldn't put a 20 foot long four by four balance beam for them to walk on. And that also relates time to fun ratio. So the amount of time they're on it, if it's easy, as long as it's super fun, then maybe it gets in the course. Uh, so I had an obstacle that, that I thought was pretty fun. Uh, I called it the uh, sea turtle. So you sat on a BOSU ball, pulled a, uh, a rope you're allowed to use, and it was on a slider. So it was wiggly, it was hard to kind of control, but it was this fun little movement of kind of surfing along this, this platform to another platform. Uh, and so it was a fun uh, obstacle. So you're on it for a little while, but it wasn't a very boring obstacle to watch. Um, but it was also difficult enough that you weren't bored on it. You really had to focus on what you're doing. So time is important that their athletes are on the obstacle in relation to how fun it is and how difficult the obstacle is as well. All right, and now athlete options. Big part, the athlete options. This is where a lot of the, the testing is gonna go in. When I do my testing, I like to think about it as I've got a certain couple of people that I'm looking at. If someone goes at it and they're the John Brown, the JSB, they're gonna be doing these huge skips, they're super powerful, and they're gonna try and huck it past it. Are, are they gonna be able to do it? Is there a way that I can design the obstacle where it forces them to do it a certain way? Or am I okay with those big moves, um, but can I make that safe as well? Um, so big skips. Can they cheat the obstacle? The Sam Folsom, the Ethan Swansons, the, the Jake Murray's very clever ninjas and also very talented ninjas. So when they're in the competition, are they gonna see something like, hey, I'm just gonna you know, parkour stride around that corner and then I don't have to deal with this upper body because I can make this big move and kind of cheat around because you said I could use my feet on that truss, but I'm only allowed hands on this so I can just tack and skip most of it. So ways to kind of cheat it um, I'm okay with, I like the creativity. I think that's a fun part of Ninja, but making sure that you don't give them too many options. When you're designing a course or an obstacle even, and you're looking at that obstacle, if you were to run it, what would be the options that you would think people could sneak around with? Um, you know, really be harsh on those obstacles. Don't think, oh, well, someone probably won't do that. Someone is probably gonna do that. Uh, and you gotta make sure it's safe for them to do that uh, and that it's something you're okay with for that course. The other athlete you have to think about is the intimidated approach. So an athlete who's maybe scared of the obstacle, they've never done it before, um, or they have a fear of heights, or it's a movement that they've gotten hurt on before, it's an intimidating obstacle for them. So they're gonna have a slow, intimidating approach. Where on a lot of balance obstacles, you may not need that or that may be very detrimental to their success. So you have to assume someone's gonna try and do it slow even if you demoed it going super fast. Uh, what does that mean for them? Is that gonna be a uh, safety risk for them? Uh, can you prepare for that? Uh, and are they able to do it slow and not 
cheat it where now everyone's just going to walk across it because they realize it's much easier that way. Um, and then the other person that I like to train for is someone who is um, uneducated about the obstacles. So they've got no idea on technique. Either they've never done it before, they're new to ninja, um, they've got different strengths and they want to try this. How are they going to take on this obstacle? I like to think uh, the easiest way to describe this is uh, a lot of ninjas have a really strong upper body, but not a lot of technique who muscle through a lot of the upper body obstacles, especially laches. So if someone doesn't really know how to do a salmon ladder transfer, I'm going to expect for them to be really engaged, have really hard impact, and that's going to be a lot on their shoulders, their arms. Um, am I going to have to worry about them swinging too hard and falling off? Am I going to have to worry about um, all that extra impact they're putting in, damaging the obstacle or causing a safety risk for them? So understanding ninjas can come in all different shapes and sizes, and you're most likely going to have all of them on the course. Even pros, even elites, you're going to have someone who doesn't know how to do the obstacle, especially if it's new. Those are the fun ones. Um, you know, you're going to have someone who's intimidated by it. You're going to have someone who tries to cheat the, uh, the design of it. And you have some people that are going to try and skip parts of the obstacle. So be prepared for those. Uh, but I find it important to make sure that those are available. I try not to eliminate them. I just try and funnel down what those options are. Because I don't want someone to be forced onto an obstacle they're not comfortable with. So you could probably do it slow and controlled if it's intimidating to you. But it's going to be really hard. And it's going to take up a lot of the time that you want for the course. Because the course limit is going to be small. Um, or you could skip it. It's a big chance and it'll save you a lot of time. But it's a really big move and a big risk if you don't make it. Alright, and now we're going into fun. How fun is it? If you do the obstacle, did you enjoy it? Did you test it? Do you want to do it again? Um, you know, that is a big part of it. When I'm designing courses, I want the athletes to have fun. Um, and it's not just, oh, this was a cool obstacle, uh, but was it challenging? What I like to say is, if it's easy, it's not fun. I like challenging obstacles. I think people enjoy that challenge and overcoming those challenges. So finding a level of difficulty where people can get through it, especially if they've never seen it, if it looks intimidating and they're able to beat it, that's also really fun. And that brings us to the last one, visuals. What does it look like? Um, you know, does it look like a cool, fun obstacle? Uh, but more importantly, does it look like it's structurally sound? Is it something that the ninjas are gonna feel safe going on and that they're going to attack? Or does it look like sketchy that they might get hurt on and then that mentality is gonna get to them and they're gonna pull back from the competition. They're not gonna have as much fun. They're not gonna give it their all and they're not gonna perform as well. Um, and then also, is it clearly defined? Can you tell where the obstacle starts, where it ends, what's in play, what's not in play? And is that confusing? So the simpler, the better. I try and make all the obstacles color coded and get one bright distinct color for everything else that I need to tape off if possible. Say. Anything that is taped red is a no-go, as much as possible. Make it clear, concise, easy to understand. That is what I go through for obstacle design. Go through that for every single obstacle I think about that I want to put into a course. Talk about my reverse body prop. Let's say I made it, I built it, uh, and it's this version right here. Now, some things I got to think about. Is it safe? Yeah, it's low to the ground. Uh, they're not going to fall very far. There isn't any big impact. Um, for them to skip it, I'm making that platform really far away. So there is no way they can just run and jump it. Their starting platform is going to be small so they don't get a big running start. That starting platform will also have to be a ending platform or it's going to be coming from a different direction or it's a linking obstacle. Uh, I could even say you could do hands feet any part of your body you want on either side uh, because they'll only have access to this side and bottom and this side and bottom. So the top would be off limits and the interior would be off limits. Uh, I could prevent them from just jumping across it by just putting um, some sort of column in the middle uh, suspended or braced upon the top of that or just make it far enough that that jump would be not possible.
what are the problems that could come up with this obstacle? It's slow. It's gonna take a lot of time to get through it. Not very exciting, uh, which is a bummer. Uh, it's also visually very close to the ground, so incidentals will play a big part in this obstacle. Um, you know, t-shirt versus shoulder is that kind of gray area, hair versus head, um, you know, butt versus shorts, making sure that they're not touching and using the ground. But the higher I make it, the more dangerous it is, especially if I make the way they can use their legs easier. So I wanna make sure that this um, is not gonna be a big headache where everyone is saying, I didn't touch, um, or they definitely touched, I didn't. Uh, it should be clearly defined. Uh, so that's a problem with this, that there's gonna be a lot of um, did or didn't they touch the ground. So I have to raise it up to make it work, but then that creates a bigger safety risk. It's consistent. Um, if I design it strong and well enough, I can make it adjustable and structurally sound. I'd probably make three quarter ply with a, a pad around that. Uh, and then same thing here, this would be wood with like a, a big meaty um, handrail ledge on it. Cause it's not about the finger strength, it's about that pulling in to get the tension there. Uh, and if I make that, that means it's safe, it's strong uh, and adjustable. I probably put some sort of metal rack that I can pin in closer and further. What are the athlete options though? That's another disappointing piece. They could put hands, feet on either side. Um, you know, they could cross their hands over, uh, but there isn't really much for them to have variety. They're just kind of, I have to do it this way, which isn't always a big deal. Spider wall is very similar to that. There's only a few options with it. Um, you know, you could jump into it further shorter, but this one, um, would be tough unless I made it high up and then they jumped into it swung in that could be an option But again a lot of problems with this obstacle still um, That I haven't been able to put it into a competition, but I like that. It's a movement that hasn't been utilized much before uh, Visuals I think it looks pretty interesting. It's definitely unique. Uh, it's definitely gonna be challenging uh, Is it gonna be fun? Don't know never tried it. Um, I Think it would be fun because it's it's new uh, and it's different, uh, but again, you never know until you test it. So yeah, uh, always something to think about is be super critical of your obstacles and your course. Remember, it's not just about getting it done, uh, but about getting it done well, making sure that it's safe and that it's fun. You want people to be raving about your competitions. Most of ninja business is referral, whether it's birthday parties or competitions, it's word of mouth. So you wanna put on the best competition you can, ran the best you can with the coolest obstacles with no injuries. All right, so before you put on a competition, you need to know what your course limits are. Very, very, very important to know what you can accommodate in a certain amount of time for a course. So I've created an equation. Screenshot that if you need. W is greater than or equal to r times the sum of t plus one added to the sum of r plus w plus a. So that means your wavelength in minutes has to be greater than or equal to the total number of runners you have multiplied by the time limit of the course in minutes plus one minute plus the rules walkthrough, the warm-up time, and the award ceremony, all of that added together. We'll break that down and make it sound a little bit easier. Essentially what we're doing is solving for the length of each wave. Now, you could solve for the length of each wave, you could solve for the number of runners you can have in each wave, or you can solve for the time limit of the course. All of those are super helpful. And you can go about it any way you want. You could say, I need to have 40 runners uh, every four hours. You can plug that in. That way, if you hit 40, then that makes it worthwhile for the gym to make money on the competition uh, within that time frame with payroll and all of that. You know you have to hit 40 runners would be good, but you need at least 20, whatever that is, but you can max 40. Then you can plug that in and figure out what the course time limit has to be to stay on time. And once you know that, 
you can then figure out how many runners actually signed up and you can adjust the course a little bit if you need from there but you need to have a good layout ahead of time for rules videos it is helpful to have it ahead of time it makes time limits much easier however psychologically for athletes it goes twofold they can see the obstacles ahead of time they can get you know strategies uh, but they don't get to see it in person which uh, for me I like to see in person I can get more feedback from it doing it all on video is great um, but if there's a certain obstacle that's super tricky maybe you show that to them to get it out of their head uh, at the competition warm-up uh, usually 10 minutes or more we don't want the athletes to feel rushed uh, and then award ceremonies usually take about 15 minutes because you have to get all of the information together of who got which placement. You have to collect the awards, you have to set up the podium, call the athletes in, give them the awards, take photos, and then you know wrap that up. So that's going to be about 15 minutes or more. Cannot stress this enough. You don't want to run over time. The more you stay on time, the more people will enjoy your competitions, the less frustrated they'll be hanging around. Um, and the more fun everyone's gonna have. So you wanna stay on time, figure out how long those waves are, figure out how many runners can be in each wave and figure out that time limit. All right, so we're gonna do one together. Now let's say I need to figure out my time limit because that's usually the, the big issue. Time limit has to be less than or equal to the length of the wave minus the time that it takes for rules, uh, warm-up, and awards, all divided by the number of runners, minus one. Now that minus one is for extra resets. Now that can be a bigger number. Uh, it's always better to be uh, overly cautious with time limits. Uh, but one minute is usually enough if you're running efficiently you can have resets done along the course and If you have a lot of resets that number is obviously going to be bigger uh, And if you have a lot of staff that number can stay around there. So I'm going to bring you around this way This is what we got. I need to figure out my time limit. My time limit has to be less than or equal to my wave Let's say I have a two hour wave. So that's 120 minutes minus rules walkthrough. I'll say I did it all online and I'm gonna give 10 minutes for rules. And then my warm up's gonna be 10 minutes. And then my award's gonna be 15 minutes. And I've got 20 runners minus one minute. So my time limit has to be less than or equal to 120 minus 10, 20, 35 over 20 minus 1. That means my time limit is less than or equal to. That would be 85 over 20 minus 1. 85 over 20, we can simplify. My time limit has to be less than or equal to 4. 0.205 minus 1 or my time limit has to be less than or equal to 3.2 minutes ta-da <laughs> so if I've got a wave that's two hours long I've got an award ceremony that's gonna be 15 minutes rules 10 minutes warm-up 10 minutes and I've got 20 athletes in that wave my time limit has to be 3 minutes 10 seconds or less or 3.2 minutes with that information I know I'm gonna stay on time granted we don't have 80 resets or any big injuries or uh, a bunch of reviews stuff like that uh, where I need to keep it under probably about 3.2 minutes so if I had this information I might make a course three minutes give myself a little bit of play um, and then making sure that that course is appropriate for that time limit now i like to make courses that really push you to keep moving and not give you rest in between to stay in that time limit uh, because i want to have a lot of good obstacles uh, but i don't want them to rest uh, i want them to have to keep pushing so that it's not a race to one obstacle but finding out your course limit 
is very, very important. You have the time limit for your course and you know what it is, that might drastically reduce how many runners you can have in each wave and that may not be economical for the gym and may not work, may not make sense. You may have to go back and change your course to make it work. I feel that it's never worthwhile to put something in a course or a, a competition if it doesn't make sense or if it's um, kind of false advertising. So I wouldn't create waves with an obstacle course knowing that we're going to go over time from the beginning. Um, and I wouldn't put a time limit on a course knowing it's not beatable within that time limit. I wouldn't put an obstacle within a course knowing that it's unsafe. All those types of things I think is important to go through ahead of time. Now, let's talk about course design. Now with course design, we have safety, obstacle variety, fun, visually clear, adjustable, flow, time limit, and balance for all athlete types. So let's say we've got all these obstacles in mind. We've got them kind of all scattered throughout the gym. Now we have to put them all together. We've got all our Lego pieces. We now have to build that Lego house. First up with obstacle design, just like before is safety. Is all those obstacles safe? Are they set up in a safe way to go from one to the other? And is the way the course is set up or even the competition, is the warm up area in a safe spot compared to the course? Is anyone going to be swinging into athletes on the course or vice versa? Same thing with spectators. Can anyone crisscross the course? That's a huge issue for safety. Rigging, making sure that's all set up, making sure all the reset equipment is out of the way and far from any athlete on the course to fall into. Um, and is there anything near those obstacles that if an athlete does happen to go out crazy, they're not gonna you know, fall through a window or into a pipe, stuff like that. So safety, super important, uh, and testing. So like we talked about, going through those obstacles for you know, the, uh, the Ethan Swansons and the, the Jake Murrays and Sam Folsoms, the ones that are doing those skips and those, those really skilled moves. Uh, you know, for the John Browns, you know, those, those big moves that are powerful, but not something that you as a, um, a safety conscious course designer would want to see. Um, someone who is intimidated by it, you know, someone who's going to be hesitant on that obstacle. Uh, and then someone who's just uneducated about how to do it is going to probably do it the wrong way. Um, a good example for an intimidating ninja on an obstacle would be something like um, the big TikTok. If I am on that, I've got to jump to the next one. If I'm intimidated to it, I may not do a big jump. I may just catch it and now it's a big whip back onto my back or my head depending how high it is and how much force it is. So keeping in mind where people are gonna fall and where the rest of the obstacles are gonna go. In that situation, if I go from one TikTok to the other one and I fall off the back of this one, this other one's gonna be swinging. I gotta make sure it's not gonna hit my athlete in the head. Um, so as much as you can design the course where you don't have to step in as a safety spotter or a obstacle blocker, stuff like that, the better your course is gonna be. Uh, so test, test, test. The more you test, the better off you're going to be. You're always going to find something that you missed, uh, but the more exhaustive you're testing in, better off you'll be. Next up is obstacle variety. Is there a good variety of upper body and lower body challenging obstacles? Not just um, agility and hanging, uh, but is there a good variety of, you know, thigh strength and ankle strength and bicep strength and tricep strength and grip and shoulders and all those different body parts. Um, we don't get a lot of triceps except for in body props and drum hoppers and handstands and those types of things or um, you know in wall pushes. So it's good to have as much variety as you can. Even some in the spider wall is really good. But to make sure Unless this is the, the point of your obstacles, this is going to be the Bicep Blaster 2000 course where everything is all biceps. And if you don't have biceps, you're not making it through this course. And that's known ahead of time, um, then it's good to have a variety throughout because not every athlete has the same strength. Not every athlete has the same weakness. And the more you even it out, the more fun everyone's going to have and enjoy your course. Also, 
Uh, we want to try and avoid grouping too many skills together. So we don't want to have all of our upper body in the beginning and then all of our lower body at the end. We want to have it scattered throughout. Um, ideally, it'd be kind of like a 1-1 a one, one, or like a 2-1-2, a two, two, something like that. Um, but you try and avoid doing them repetitively. I know upper body is great to combine them together to get them taxed, uh, but it's better if you can have some um, variety in what you're taxing. So it's not just cliffhanger, other cliffhanger, different cliffhanger variation, but maybe it's vertical limit, it's uh, cliffhanger, it's pegboard, it's devil steps, it's something different. Uh, so it's not always the same muscles every time and different movements as well. Fun. Fun is really important with course design. Uh, when you're designing a course and you're gonna imagine that athlete comes to the gym, sees the video uh, rules, you want them to finish that video or look at the course and just be like, man, I can't wait to do this. This is really exciting. You want them to really be excited to get on your course and do the best they can. Uh, you don't want them to be like, all right, I guess I have to do this and I guess I can do that. Um, I've done that before, but you want them to have that, you know, that, that drive, that energy and them be like, man, that's going to be really fun. I haven't tried that. It's a little intimidating, but it looks cool. So I'm excited to get on it. So making sure it's fun. Uh, what makes it fun? So many things. Can people see and cheer them on the obstacles? Uh, if you can get a crowd with the pandemic and all that stuff, you don't always get that option, but wherever you can get your audience to be able to see and cheer on your athletes, that makes it a lot more fun for them. And of course the crowd, which then brings the energy in the room up. If you have obstacles hidden behind other pieces, it's a little bit of a lull. They don't really know to cheer yet. And if someone falls in one of those obstacles, it's always disappointing. It's that quiet walk back from the obstacle and no one knows what happened. Uh, so make it as visually accessible as possible to everyone. Um, that way you get bigger cheers. Everyone can see all those really big saves. Is it unique? Is it different than things they've seen before? Is it something that, you know, they saw on the course that no other gym has seen before? Um, you know, the more unique you make it, the more fun people have. I like to make things into, you know, certain themes. So what ended up being my caterpillar obstacle was uh, logs you had to climb up and around and then swing through this big rotating cliffhanger ledge. Um, made it look like a big caterpillar, called it the caterpillar. Uh, we talked about the sea turtle before of that obstacle with the little sliders underneath the BOSU ball, it looked like a turtle. Call it a sea turtle, make it fun. Uh, put little eyes on the front of it. Again, does it look fun? Uh, is it a cool looking obstacle? Does it, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like a child's animal like mine. Uh, but you know, the corkscrew, that thing looks fun. It looks intimidating, but it looks fun. It's this big wheel and you know it's just going to start whipping you around. It's a new move. Those things are always fun uh, and unique. Is it challenging? No one wants to just walk through a course. Um, you want to have a course that is actually challenging for them not just the individual obstacles, but as they go through and through, if you're a ninja athlete and you're looking at a course, you're like, all right, I've done that obstacle. That's gonna be good. I can do that. I can do that. Okay, I'm probably gonna be tired at this point. Okay, this is gonna be really tough here. All right, I'm gonna have to really save my energy because of this obstacle, I'm gonna really have to dig deep and complete. Those are the types of thoughts that I love my athletes to have when they're going through the courses. It's going to be challenging for them, especially towards the end, but no one piece is going to be, you know, the death of everyone. You don't want a course that is just run to get to obstacle six or whatever it is. You want them to have fun and be challenged the entire way. And you're going to have falls. You're going to have mistakes. Um, but we need to have it challenging uh, as they're going through. Is the course stressful and intimidating? Uh, you don't want to have a horribly intimidating or stressful obstacle as the very first one. The first obstacle is already intimidating and stressful. So I like to try and put something straightforward and simple on that uh, to get that athlete's mentality back in the game of, I can do this, this is gonna be fun. I already got one obstacle down, I'm on to the next one. So trying to keep that psychological aspect of the athlete in mind when designing this course so they're not super stressed going through it. Um, and then is the course unstable, is it unsafe? Uh, does it look like one big solid professionally put together piece or is it you know 
plywood nailed to a two by four, you know, that can twist and spin and crack and splinter, you know, do the athletes feel safe on it? That's gonna be a big factor of if they're having fun or not. Visually clear. We talked about making sure that the obstacle is clearly defined of what's on, what's off. Is the course visually clear? Are there unnecessary pieces in the way? Uh, so let's say if I can remove any pieces that are not in the course, I should remove them or block them off completely so that someone on the course isn't going to be distracted by it or think that that's part of the course. You wanna try and minimize everything in the gym for no distractions of just what the course they have so it's a clearly defined route for them to go. You wanna make sure that's clearly marked so that someone gets to a landing platform and they don't realize, do I have to go left, do I go right, do I go forward? It should be easily and visually distinct for them to know I go right to this spot. Is it visually clear for the spectators as well? We talked about that, not just in terms of what they can see, but do they understand where the course is going? If someone's on an obstacle and they're going through the course, the spectators and the audience are gonna to wanna to cheer for them and tell them, you got this, go, you can lache, you know, run, run, run. And you wanna make sure that they're not giving them the wrong advice because they think the warp ball is next, but really, you know, that's three obstacles down the line. Let's go into adjustable. So really just talking about, is the course adjustable for different age groups? And how much time does that take for you to go from, you know, your kids to your preteens and so on, whatever age groups you're doing. When you're setting up a course to run multiple age groups in a day, try and scale them. So it either goes from elite down to kids or it goes from kids up to elites. That way you can just make minute changes every time and start expanding and building these obstacles bigger or smaller rather than have to go up, back, up, back. And that's a lot of extra work and makes it much harder for you, especially if you're taking pieces on and putting them back off. Because remember, you have to mark every piece that you put down so you know where it goes in case it gets knocked over or you have to reset it. Now let's talk about flow. So obstacle course flow. Um, what's the layout like? You know, is that clearly defined? Do they know where to go? Um, are there smooth transitions from one obstacle to the other? I love having a starting platform and a landing platform be the same one so there isn't any confusion of where you go next because the only thing in front of you is another obstacle. If I'm on a course and I land on an obstacle but there is a cliffhanger in front of me, a salmon ladder to my left, and a spider wall to my right, but I came to the platform sideways, which one do I go to? I'm not exactly sure unless I have the rules memorized. It should be clear that they go to this one. It's usually the closest one or, you know, there's a path for them to walk down. It should be something that they can see and understand without it being super confusing and without you having to tell every athlete, go left, go left, go left. Uh, and then are there gaps? Does it flow well or are there big gaps where, you know, let's say this is, this is my course and these are all my obstacles. Am I starting here and going boom, 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 and scattered around? Or does it flow nicely where I don't have to backtrack and there's no gaps between the obstacles? I know where to flow. Time limit. We just talked about that with our, our course limits. Uh, but that time limit, what's the time limit for the athlete on the course? Is that enough time for them? Is it gonna give them a lot of rest? Where is that gonna put them in their mentality of the starting block or I have to bolt right out of the gate? Um, and then what's your reset time on that time limit? Am I going to be resetting every single obstacle? Or do I only have to reset after they get to obstacle eight? Or do I get to start resetting once I'm at obstacle eight because all the resets are in the beginning of the course? Uh, knowing what that reset is gonna be and how you can integrate it into the course is very helpful when you're setting a course limit and your wave time limit. So now, is it balanced for all the athlete types? Uh, so we talked about um, you know those, those four kind of types of athletes, the intimidated, the you know uneducated, the super skillful, and then you know the super daring um but not just that but physically you know the tall and the short ninjas you want to make sure that every athlete can engage the obstacle and that they have an opportunity to get through it now a spider wall 
um, is a great example. If I have a four foot wide spider wall, that can be really tough for some of the, the shorter athletes to go through, but I can put an obstacle later in the course or earlier in the course where it's low to the ground and then that really makes it harder for the tall people. So for instance, if I have a course, I might put a spider wall in it. And then right after the spider wall, I may put a body prop, but the body prop is gonna be very skinny so that the tall people are super scrunched up, but the short people have a much easier time. Stuff like that, make sure that's balanced throughout the course and not at opposite ends of the course. You want them fairly close, so uh, those athletes that may have a disadvantage won't get that advantage too far down the line, but they'll be able to access it even if they're super tired. Uh, and then you also have to think about not just height, but weight. So weight can play a big factor on a lot of uh, obstacles, especially sliding ones and moving obstacles. The heavy versus the light athlete. If I am a very heavy athlete, going across the dominoes is gonna be quite difficult for me, where if I'm a lightweight athlete, that's gonna be easier. So making sure that that is even as well. So maybe I do a, um, a crank it up is gonna be easier for the heavy athlete to get that nice big arch to push that weight up but the balance obstacle is gonna be much harder for him where the uh, lighter athlete could literally walk across the balance, but they're gonna to have to put in a lot more effort to crank up that obstacle. So weight is also something to pay attention to, not just height for athletes. That is our course design that I go through. I've gone through the obstacle design. I found my obstacles. I plug them into a course design and I see how they fit. And then if they don't, they get nixed. And if they do, they're in the course. So let's say, we'll go back to that reverse body prop. I like the idea, I have a place for it in the course, uh, now I have to start figuring it out. How would it work? How am I gonna have them go through it? Figure it out, we're gonna crunch them, and I know that body shape and the material that it would be in. Um, how would it be useful in a competition? Um, you know, does it fit into this part of the course? Yep, I like where it is. How could I build it? That's where a lot of the trickiness comes in. Having an idea and making reality can be a big gap sometimes. Uh, maybe I can build it, uh, I know how to build it, I know how to put the pieces together, but I don't quite have the time or the money or the expertise to get it done right and safely enough to put in the competition. Let's say I do, then I build it, I do a test build, make sure the pieces work the way I want it to, and then build the whole thing, test it out, and then once it's all tested, it can go on the course. Um, but I wanna review my obstacle and the course review. So is it safe? I go through everything that I've set up. Is the course safe? Are all the obstacles safe? Check. Is it fun? Are the athletes gonna enjoy what they're doing? Are they gonna have a good time? Are they gonna feel like it's worth their money when they get here uh, and when they leave? Uh, three, the experience of the ninjas and the spectators. Are they gonna enjoy, you know, not just the course and what the runners are doing, but the way things are organized, the way things are run, the way things are set up? Is it easy check-in? Did I make that clear? Did I make rules clear? Did I make warm-up area clear? Did I make, um, you know, video review clear? Did I make, you know, what we're doing and the process and the schedule clear? All that is really important. Um, and then test it, test it, and test it. Test everything as much as you can. Uh, do full course runs if you can, do individual obstacles, video it, review it, come back at it later, make sure that everything is the way that you want it, and get other eyes on it. So, because I have designed the course and I've designed the obstacles, I have a certain viewpoint. So I like to bring in either other employees or other ninjas that aren't competing or aren't involved so that they can give me their input, but that outside perspective can give you a better education of what someone can like come into your course trying to do. So my process, I design the obstacles, I try and link several of them together, I test for safety and difficulty, I then adjust after that testing, I fill in the gaps of what could go in there, and then I film a rules video, uh, and then I make adjustments after that, especially after the rules video, I get a lot of information from that. Uh, and then at the very end, I add a time limit. But while I'm creating, I always have an idea of how much time I wanna put in. But that time limit is going to determine, do I cut out an obstacle? Uh, do I need to 
make an obstacle easier or quicker, whatever that may be, to make it applicable into um, you know this competition. Don't force an obstacle or a course into a specific competition unless it makes sense. I've put many obstacles to the side and brought them back later because it just didn't work in that one flow. You know, I had an awesome idea, I've got this, this obstacle will be perfect here, but when I brought it into the full thing, it was just taking up too much time, it was too difficult, it was too finicky. Save it for a later event where it fits better. So that is it for me. That's how I go through designing an obstacle course, a competition, and obstacles themselves. I try and break it down as much as I can. Hopefully, visually, this was uh, helpful for you. I know I didn't have a lot of hands-on moving stuff with you, but um, always happy to answer any questions if you have about a course or an obstacle or things that might come into play. So I hope you do it. I hope you have fun and enjoy your competitions. They're a lot of work, but totally worth it.